Hi, and welcome to today's little quickie. It probably won't be that quick. And today what I want to do is a little repair job. And I have this junction. It's, it's the link between the table of a small drill press and the column of that same drill press. And this cast part has a design flaw in it that induced a stress crack over time. So, here's a picture of the part, so we can see it in a little more detail, and here's a close-up of that crack. Now, I could try and repair this part, but it's quite flimsy, and I just don't have confidence in it anymore. So, I'm going to remake a new one. And in doing so, well, I'm going to try and correct one of the major problems that I find with this type of junction. And to do that, well, I'm going to use this piece of aluminum that is quite nice now because I've finished it up and squared it all up. But this is an old piece of junk that had been kicking around the bottom of a box in my shop for probably around 30 years. So it's all cleaned up, ready to go. So this is what we're going to use to replace this part. But as I said, I'm not going to mimic this part. I'm going to make it simpler. Uh, easier to produce and I'm going to try and solve that problem the problem that gets on my nerves with this type of junction Okay, well here's what I want to do now if we look at our original part here I have this boss at the end where the table the drill press table uh, slides on uh, That boss is what I want to start with and if I look here we can see it as this intermediary circle here we can see it at the end of the part and at the end of the part this is a third angle projection three view drawing so I have my front view my left hand view and I have a bottom view down here so we can see how this goes we're looking at it this way we can see the boss we can see the diameter but what I can't see on the sketch here is this second diameter which should show up as a rectangle in that left hand view. There's a good reason for that. I'm not going to do it. I want to simplify this part and there's no reason to have it this way. The main reason that it's all formed this way well is to save material and that's not something that's a problem for me. I'm starting with a piece of scrap so if I waste a little no biggie here. And if I turn the part sideways, I'll notice another main difference. I have the boss at the end, and the boss at the end, and I have the hole here going through the part where the column of the drill press will uh, insert eventually. But what I don't have on my drawing is this, this screw thingy, okay, that's going to tighten this down onto the column. This is what gets on my nerves. On these smaller drill presses, especially when they're used in wood shops, well, it's nice to be able to take the table off and get it out of the way because quite often people want to work with a sub table, in other words, a larger piece of wood sitting directly onto the foot of, or the base, or the foot of the drill press. And the table's always in the way, but to take a table off of these small drill presses, you have to remove the head from the drill press or else you have to put up with this thing that seems to always be in the way. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to change the approach. We have our cylindrical shape, and I'll get my part out. So at this end, we'll have our boss. Then we have our cylindrical shape, and we're going to bore a hole through it for the column. And we're not going to have anything to screw in that direction. What we're going to do is, once this is formed up, is we're going to split down the middle of that hole on both sides so that the back end becomes independent from the front. And before we did that, well, we'll have screwed in two uh, screw holes there, and you'll see that's going to be quite fun to do. Uh, we're going to put two holes in this direction so that it acts somewhat like a very accurate U-bolt. So that means that once I, if I ever want to remove the table from the machine, well, I won't have to remove the head from the base, from the column. I'll just be able to unscrew those screws, remove the back end of this uh, link, and remove the table, and then I can reassemble it and put it aside, keeping all my parts together. So, what are we going to do here? Well, we're going to start by 
uh, producing this boss and this half inch 13 threaded hole. Well not really because the piece of scrap that I had already has this nice half inch 13 hole uh, produced in it so I'm just going to reuse this hole which just happened to be, like maybe I should go buy a lottery ticket, the right size for the job at hand here. So we want to transfer or scribe or lay out onto my piece of aluminum something that will guide me to produce this boss. Uh, and well what I normally do is measure the boss, set up a pair of dividers uh, to scribe a circle around the center of this part. But I do have a problem here and that is that I have a half inch thirteenth uh, threaded hole in the middle of the part and nowhere to set up a divider. And I don't want to go through the trouble of producing a pop plug for this. I mean this isn't an important operation. It's just to sort of guide me as I'm cutting to get close to my diameter before having to measure. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to scribe it in a different way. And for that, well, I'm going to need my trusty center head on my trusty 12 inch ruler. And I'm going to start by just scribing a line across the face of the part using this tool. Now that I have that line that I can refer to that goes right through the center of the part, I'm now going to lay out two points to show the extremities or the positions of the edge of the boss along that line uh, uh, relative to the center of this part. And how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to use this center head on my ruler once again. But I'm just going to set it so that the end of the ruler positions itself in the right place along that line. Now how am I going to do that? Well, all I have to do is calculate the difference between one edge of the boss and the outer edge of the part the boss is going on to. Now, the boss I measured on this part here measures one and three quarters of an inch. My aluminum part here measures three inches in diameter. So three inches minus one and three quarters, well that leaves one and one quarter inches. But remember the boss is in the middle and the over dimension is on both sides. So one and one quarter inch divided by two, so I have each side, well that leaves five eighths of an inch per side. So I'm gonna set my ruler at two five eighths of an inch uh, from the edge of the part along the line that I just scribed. So let's take a look at that. So I'm setting up my 5 eighths of an inch. There it is. Now I'm going to lock 5 eighths from the edge of the part, I'm now going to scribe a small line at the end of the ruler that comes and touches the through line that I've produced. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. And now I'm going to highlight the two intersections that I've produced with this permanent marker. Well, that's done, but you're probably going to say, Mark, that's not a circle, that's two dots. And that's one more dot than you need, actually. Because when I was an apprentice years and years ago, my foreman, John Slobodian, came up to me as I was doing some layout work and told me, quite bluntly, he's a great guy, but a little rough around the edges. So shield your ears if you're easily offended. He said to me, Mark, quit wasting your fucking time. Don't draw a nice circle. You're doing lathe work. Just draw a dot, and when you get it spinning, it'll look like a circle. And true enough, he was right. As you'll see in just a few seconds, because now we're going to set this part up into the forejaw, center it, and start turning that boss. So, I have my part 
roughly centered in this four jaw truck and I have my dial indicator set up. But I want to be clear about something here. This part hangs out of the jaws quite a bit, so I'm going to have to cut delicately on the end. But more than that, I could have a problem with the centering of this part. And that is that if the part is set up presently in the chuck with its, its axis parallel to the axis of the lathe and it's eccentric, well, it's going to be turning that way out of round. However, it could very well be that the part is not round or it's not parallel to the axis of this machine. And in that case, well, it'll be turning in this way. And that's really out of kilter. And that could be problematic. So I'm going to check my center in two places. Now, the first place I'm going to check and set my center at is right up close to the four jaws themselves. Because that, the end of the jaws, is sort of like the pivot point of the part. I'm going to set its center there. Then I'm going to come out to the end and check the end for center. And if it's not on center, well, I'm not going to adjust the jaws. I'm going to tap the part into its center position. Then I'm going to return to the start here, close to the jaws, and recheck. It shouldn't have moved that much in this position, close to the jaws, because as I said, the jaws are the pivot point. Now, I'm not going to go through the centering process uh, A to Z, because we have a video that uh, talks about centering parts in four jaw chucks. And uh, you can find, well, not a link to it, but here's the name of that video, and you can find it on my webpage, that lazymachinist.com. All the videos are free, you don't have to sign up to watch anything on that free channel. That being said, let's get to our centering operation. Well, that's center within a thousandth of an inch, and that's more than good enough for what we're doing here. So I'm going to set the indicator aside, and we can start turning that boss on the end of this part. Now, I'm going to start by positioning my tool to give me a rough idea of the major diameter that I have to cut to. I'm going to be cutting from the outside diameter towards the center, and what I don't want to do 
is overshoot. So I'm going to start by making a mark there, something that I know I don't want to go any further than. I'm going to start by positioning the tool, just proud of that dot that I produced on my part. That's my limit dot, I guess we could call it. And that's going to guarantee that I don't go undersize on my boss. But I don't know really if I made a mistake if this marking is off center. And that's why I made this second dot. And I'm going to just turn the part 180 degrees to verify that I'm positioned in the same way on the second dot. And that tells me I have my proper minimal diameter and I am centered. So now we can start and we're going to start by producing a little line all around here. Okay, so I have my mark and I have something to shoot for now. I'm going to be cutting from the outside towards that mark. And I don't want to go any further than that mark because for this first roughing operation, my lead end angle, my lead cutting edge on my tool is going to have a slightly positive angle to it. And well, you may not know what that means. Well, if you don't, uh, I have a video about that. So if you want to look at how to position tools to cut properly, Here's the name of that video, and again, you can find it on my webpage in the little quickie section. So it's slightly positive, and that means that I can't get a square shoulder, so I don't want to go right up to my final diameter. What I'm going to do is come close to it, but never go past it, get my width cut, and I'm going to have to take several cuts. I can't take a large cut here, the part isn't supported properly. And then I am going to change my tool orientation so that I have clearance on my lead and on my side uh, cutting surfaces. And then I'm going to surface, not surface, but turn the diameter of my boss and then surface the shoulder, but this way coming from the center towards the edge, so in the other direction. That will give me a nice finish as long as I take a very small cut. So, let's take a look at that operation. Well, that takes care of the width of cut. I have left just a little bit on there for finishing uh, during my final pass. But my diameter still needs work. I mean, I'm still quite a bit oversized. So, to be able to get a nice clean parallel edge on my diameter, I'm going to have to change the angle of the tool. And in order, once it's turned to its proper diameter, in order to get a proper shoulder and that finishing cut on my way back out, well I'm going to make sure that I have a slight clearance on my lead cutting edge and a slight clearance on my trailing cutting edge. And that will permit the point of this tool that has a very small radius on it, it will permit that point to work its way into the corner and produce cutting widthwise and outward a nice clean square shoulder. So let's adjust this tool.
So everything seems right as far as dimensions go, but there's really nothing quite like trying it on. So here's the small drill press table. Let's give it a fit. Well that fit quite nicely. So what's left to do here on the lathe? Well, a small deburring operation and getting the part out of there and ready for milling. So here we have our table mounted on our soon to be completed part. Soon to be, well not that soon, because there's going to be a part two to this little quickie video. That's as far as we're going to get today. In our next video, well we're going to be milling a flat on the top of this cylinder for two reasons. First is it's slightly proud of the table and I don't want that interference. And secondly, it's going to give me a reference in rotation because once I bore that hole through this cylinder, it becomes three-dimensional. And I want something to be able to find my reference in rotation because eventually I'm going to produce those two screw holes that will hold all this together once the part is split in two. So, part two coming up and it shouldn't be too long because my nephew Benoit, yes the very same one that plays the guitar in the little monkey song well is waiting for his machine so it should come pretty quick so until then have fun be safe and happy machining I need you.